Hi, and welcome to Codex. Our speaker today is Igor Bala, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Dr. Bala earned his PhD from ETH Zurich in 2019 under the direction of Benny Sudikov. His research involves problems at the intersection of combinatorics, linear algebra, and geometry. Today, he will tell us about equiangular lines and regular graphs. Please take it away, Igor. So thank you for having me. Uh, I just wanna say that since this talk is being recorded and since you were warned so much that this is the case, I really you know, think you I encourage you to ask questions because you never know my answer might be uh, you know, stupider than your question. Anyways, uh, so today I'm gonna to wanna to talk about a problem that's very dear to me uh, about equiangular lines and uh, as they're related to regular graphs. I wanna say something interesting about both of these things. And here I have a picture of both of these kinds of objects. Uh, so first, some basic definition. A set of lines passing through the origin is called equiangular if uh, every pair of lines makes the same angle. What I mean by makes the same angle, I mean is that the, the acute angle between the lines is the same for any pair. And the basic question uh, is, what is the maximum number of equiangular lines you can have in our dimensional Euclidean space? And uh, this is an old question, and it's considered to be one of the founding problems of algebraic graph theory. So that's one of the motivations for why I was interested in it. Uh, like I said, it's an old question. It goes back to the, to the works of Hantes and his student Seidel. And, uh, as you can see from then on, there were a lot of uh, works by Seidel. Uh, he was kind of a main guy, um, but maybe this audience already knows more about this anyway. So the connections that this question has is to various fields of math, including elliptic geometry. That's where Hantes was first interested in it. And uh, uh, then also um, more recently frame theory and the theory of polytopes, it makes sense that these two things are related, but uh, it's interesting. Um, but uh, perhaps even more surprisingly is that the uh, complex version, probably also the real version, uh, has to do with algebraic number theory. Um, I mean, also the real version does. Uh, and as, as well as quantum information theory. So uh, I think this is more than enough motivation for, for studying these things and for answering this question. Um, okay, so first let's go through some basic examples. Uh, in two dimensions, well, uh, the most number of lines you can have is just three. That's it, that's the construction, it's very easy. Can't do better than that. Uh, so then, you know, you can think about why. But uh, for, for three dimensions, uh, maybe it's a little bit harder to, to see why this is the optimal thing to do, but you can have six lines, and that's by taking the icosahedron uh, and connecting the, pair, the uh, six pairs of antipodal points. Um, and then I wanna look at two more important examples, the seven dimension case, uh, in which case we can have 28 lines. And uh, the way you construct that is by taking all 28 permutations of uh, the following vector. So this is a, a vector with eight coordinates. So there are eight choose two or 28 uh, choices for where to put threes. And if you take any two such vectors and you take their inner product, you will see that it is plus or minus eight. Uh, and why this is uh, what we want is because if we now take a line along each vector, then we'll get a collection of 28 lines. And because all of the inner products are plus or minus uh, the same. Also, all of the angles will be the same. Uh, we'll see this again. Um, last question. Oh yeah, I should mention that this is, I said seven dimensions, but this is eight dimensional vectors. But actually, if you, saw, if you take the sum of all these vectors, they add up to zero. So indeed, they lie in a seven dimensional subspace. And I drew a picture here of the Schleifli graph, which is in uh, actually the, the graph uh, which uh, corresponds to, the, to this construction in some sense. It's a graph on 27 vertices and it's strongly regular. 
Uh, maybe this is the complement of the appropriate, whatever, it's not so important, um, but good. And the other example I want to give is the 23 dimensional case. And, and I'm not gonna describe it except to say that it has 276 lines and the uh, corresponding strongly regular graph in this case is the uh, McLaughlin graph. Uh, and and uh, this picture isn't even a picture of the McLaughlin graph. It's a picture of maybe the, the neighborhood of a vertex in it, be, just because I guess uh, the internet didn't have a graph this big, but this is still a nice picture. So uh, I decided to put it. Okay, so now that we're all, uh, we understand, we have some examples. Um, the reason why I brought those examples, oh, sorry, is that actually those are examples where we know we have a matching upper bound. So in 73, uh, Gerritsen proved uh, this, the upper bound for equiangular lines that in our dimensions, you can have no more than R plus one choose two. And indeed those, the numbers, uh, for R being two, three, seven, and 23, that the numbers I gave you in the previous slide are R plus one choose two. Um, so let's actually give a quick proof of this statement. Um, probably you guys have seen it before, but it actually will lead us further in, when we give maybe one more proof later. So uh, let's, let's give a short proof of this, nothing complicated. So uh, as uh, uh, the way we always think about it, this problem is we will always choose unit vectors, one for each line. Um, and it's important to notice that you have a choice for each line. You have two vectors you can choose, either the vector or its negation. And depending on the choice, um, well, because the lines had the same angle, the inner product, which is the cosine of said angle, has to also be the same, plus or minus, up to, again, the fact that you can choose V or its negation. So in particular, we know then that if you have some equiangular lines and we choose unit vectors along them, then the inner product will be plus or minus alpha for some alpha. And uh, I sometimes call alpha the angle. Uh, the point is from now on, we will always talk about alpha. Uh, good. So the idea is to consider the following matrices, uh, VI, VI transpose. So these are projection matrices. Um, and uh, the point is they live in the space of symmetric matrices. They are symmetric. Um, and the space of such matrices in, in our dimensions is uh, R plus one choose two. Um, it's basically the number of entries above the diagonal, which, which uh, you can count. Um, so if I could show to you that these uh, matrices are as vectors linearly independent or just as matrices, then uh, we will be done. So how do we do that? Well, uh, we use the Frobenius inner product. The Frobenius inner product is the absolute most obvious inner product you could think of for matrices. It's just what you would do if you had to guess what, what it would be. It's just you, you sum up over all the entries, the corresponding AIJ entry times the corresponding BIJ entry. And that's the Frobenius inner product of two matrices A and B. But it also has this nice uh, form in terms of the trace and uh, algebraically, this is more useful sometimes. So now let's just compute something. Um, if we take two of these guys, VI, VI transpose and VJ, VJ transpose, and we take their Frobenius inner product, then it's this, right? And then you can just see that the VI transpose VJ can come out and then you're left with a trace VI, VJ transpose, which just gives you again, VI transpose VJ. So at the end of the day, you get the inner product of VI and VJ squared, which because VI and VJ inner product was plus or minus alpha, we know that the square of it will always be alpha squared uh, for I not equal to J. And so now, you know, uh, it means that these, these matrices form uh, a simplex in, in, the, uh, in the space of symmetric matrices. And, uh, Moreover, they form what I call an acute simplex, although I have not defined that anywhere, but um, because the inner product is alpha squared, it's positive. So I, you know, I think of it as uh, like an acute simplex somehow, if that makes sense. And, and um, that's it, okay. So uh, if no one has any questions about this proof, um, we can move on and uh, give some more. <clears throat> motivation and, and describe, discuss the history of like what was known before. 
So as I said to you before, uh, the, the, the examples 237 and 23 uh, are tight and actually no other cases of equality are known. Um, and it's an open problem whether there are any others. Like certainly for some, for, for many R, it's not gonna be possible, but there is an infinite set of possible Rs for which we cannot exclude it to be the case. And this is an, an interesting question. Um, maybe one of the most interesting about this problem. Um, so, you know, if we can't be tight, can we at least get the right order of magnitude? So, so R plus one choose two is on the order of R squared. Um, and, and so uh, there's a question of whether you can actually construct R squared lines. And indeed in 2000, uh, Dekan actually managed to do this. Um, and this is based on the existence of Kerdock codes uh, or mutual and biased basis, um, large sets of these things. Um, so it's quite non-trivial, uh, at, at least to me. Um, and you know th this came quite a bit later after the, the upper bound. So there was some period where people didn't really know what was going on. Um, and so one important thing about these constructions is that they all have an alpha, this common inner product, which is on the order of one over square root R. It's like very nearly one over root R uh, for some of them. Okay. Uh, so because of this, um, you know, um, well, let me just, I'll come back to this point, but I want to just say one more theorem here because it's important to state it. Um, and this is the only instance where algebraic number theory kind of rears its head. Uh, for, so in 73 also uh, Newman proved that if the number of lines is more than twice the dimension, then this number has to be an integer. Now, this is already very interesting because it means that when this is not an integer, n is at most 2r. Um, and uh, because of this, uh, Lemons and Seidel defined n sub alpha of r, aka the maximum number of equiangular lines in r dimensions with, with common angle r cosine alpha or common dot product alpha. Um, and they were particularly interested in the case where alpha is such that this is an integer which means alpha has to be one over an odd integer, one third, one fifth, one seventh, and so on. Um, but it's still interesting in some sense to ask the question even when alpha, when this is not an integer. Um, okay, so, so now we really know kind of why we care about this question to some extent. Um, so now I would like to tell you what we can say about n sub alpha of r, what, what was previously known. Um, so now I'm just going to summarize what I know, which is also relevant uh, for this question. So some of these things, I'm sure if you're familiar with the stuff you've seen. Uh, so we have the relative bound, which was proven by Lemons and Seidel already again in 73. And it just, it says that rough when alpha is small, smaller than one over root R, then you have a bound, which is basically linear in R because you know when alpha is much smaller than one over root R this denominator is like one and so we just have a term which is like R. Uh, okay and, and there's reasons to believe that that this is kind of the I mean you know you guys know that uh, there are many examples where it's tight. Um, uh, examples of tightness correspond to equiangular type frames so uh, it's you know maybe this bound can be improved in some ways but I somehow just don't, don't want to think about it too much. Uh, okay, so uh, during my PhD together with uh, Felix Draxler, Peter Kivash and my advisor, Benny, uh, we, we actually proved that in, in the event that uh, when alpha is very big on, in sort of the other extreme, when alpha is much, much bigger than say one over root log R, I mean, we were, we were really thinking of alpha being fixed and R going to infinity, but this is the regime in which it works. We showed that uh, the bound actually becomes linear, it is, is linear again. So, so while the absolute bound is quadratic, as we can see in both of these extreme regimes, the bound is linear. Um, and moreover, we were able to characterize equality, like it happens only when alpha is one third. Uh, 
So, okay, so that raised the question of what about in between? And there's not so much that's known for everything in between, actually. Uh, so the main thing is that uh, after our work, uh, Glazier and then you managed to give a bound that works for basically all alpha, kind of the first universal bound. Um, and their bound is on the order of R over alpha squared, as you can see here. So if you think about R over alpha squared, it's like, um, well, I should mention to you that um, when you, we have the, the case, when we have equality in the absolute bound, namely we have R, square, R plus one choose two vectors, then the corresponding alpha needs to be exactly one over square root of R plus two. So it, it definitely, in, in that case, uh, both the relative bound and the absolute bound give the same answer. And, and this bound is at least asymptotically on the right order because then alpha squared, one over alpha squared is like R. And so this is like R squared. So at least this bound gets you the right order of magnitude when you are close to one over root R. But when you're, you know, when alpha is big, um, this is definitely wrong because we expect the answer to have a constant coefficient that doesn't depend on alpha here. So, so certainly there's room for improvement there. And I'll just mention one, one more bound for completeness sake. Uh, when alpha is, is slightly bigger than one over root R plus two, uh, but uh, in this range, then U was able to give like a, a, gen, a bound which, which can be seen as a refinement again of the absolute bound. But if, if the relative bound is like refines the absolute bound, but to the left side, then, then this would do it to the right side, but only for a little bit. And that's, that's almost everything. And then um, uh, following some, uh, our, my, my work with, uh, following, following my previous work, uh, Zhang, Tidor, Yao, Zhang, and Zhang and Zhao, uh, Yufei Zhao, actually extended some of our ideas and, well, proved uh, an exact result. Um, so here's what they proved. Um, they proved that under a sh even stronger assumption on alpha, it, you know, if I had one over log r, now we have one over log log r. Um, and moreover, there's this, this, this term that I should describe. So if, if we let k sub alpha be the minimum number of vertices in a graph who ha which has spectral radius exactly this, this magic number. Um, so of course, this, this, there might not be any graph with, whose spectral radius is this. And in that case, they prove something else, but don't worry about it for now. So if there is such a thing, then, then we, we take it. And then the n sub alpha of r is exactly this. When provided that alpha is bigger than, than this term. Uh, so, you know, if alpha is one over an odd integer, then one minus alpha over two alpha is that integer. And, and then what's the, you know, if, if this is an integer, what's the smallest graph which has this as an spectral radius? It's the complete graph on this many plus one vertices. So K sub alpha is just, in that case, is just this number plus one. So, so you can think of it as being on the order of one over alpha, at least for the cases that we care about. Um, okay, and I even summarized all this stuff in a picture, which is very not to scale. I realized actually that sometimes it's, not, it's wise to not draw things to scale, then at least things are visible and you can see what's going on. So here I've labeled for you everything on this axis from, this is alpha from zero to one. And this is, these are the, the bounds, the purple, one is the, the relative bound. Um, this, this teal one is the bound of U, which works, like I said, slightly to the right of one over root two. And then all the way on the other extreme, I put the bound of uh, Jang and, and, ever, and others uh, where, where we completely have the answer determined. Um, and so now finally, uh, I can tell you guys about new results. Okay, so here's my first year. There you go, there it is. Uh, so this theorem is already better than the previous best known universal bound of Glazier and then you, because instead of an R over alpha squared, you have an R over alpha here. 
And moreover, um, when we are closer to this side, this term is the one that dominates. And so actually this is definitely something new. Um, it's still a bit weaker than, than the bound of U when we are very close, but it's, it's quite close. Um, it's very nearly matching. And, and the proof of this is just based on uh, bo bounding the eigenvalues of the gram matrix of, of, the, of the corresponding vectors. Um, I won't be able to get too much more into it, but um, the argument is actually quite simple. And um, I, I'll just tell you quickly that the idea is that basically I'm able to show that the largest eigenvalue of the gram matrix is either quite small or very large. And depending on these two cases, you get kind of a two bounds. And so th these are the, the bounds you get in either case. Okay, so, so anyway, this is already nice, but it's still not good enough, right? So like we want that when alpha is very large compared to, to, to what we want that, that you really get something that's on the order of R. Because remember I said, I already proved that when alpha is bigger than one over lo root log r, the bound is like two r. So, so this can still be improved. And indeed I'm able to do so. And that's the next theorem. So here I've written it exactly, but uh, just don't worry about this. Just look at the, this, this expression. So it's just a maximum of, of you know, two over alpha to the fifth and two r. And, and uh, now I've drawn everything here for you guys, like where, what bound is best. So now you can really see what's going on. So um, at like, at alpha being one over R to the one quarter is where the blue bound meets the, meets this bound, two over alpha to the fifth. And then that continues up until one over R to the one fifth. And then from then on, this other behavior takes over. Um, and like, it's a bit coincidental at, at first I thought that uh, that the point here, uh, one over R to the one quarter is coincidentally also the point where these two terms are, are roughly equal in magnitude. So, so to the left of this point, uh, only this term takes over. Um, so it's a kind of a coincidence that where these two guys meet is also where, where this term meets. But it's not actually a coincidence. Uh, um, I think that there's an, a reason for it that has to do with like when the largest eigenvalue jumps from being uh, small, which is kind of in this regime, to being big, which is in this regime. And when it is big, the corresponding eigenvector is very close to the all ones vector. And that's, I think, why this is happening. But I cannot say more about this. I don't have the time. Um, OK. so. And I just should just mention that the proof of this is uh, based on bounding the degrees of a corresponding graph. Um, and then after you, we bound the degrees of said graph, we improve that bound by an Alon Bopana type theorem, like bootstrap. So, Igor, are any of these bounds achievable? Uh, good question. So um, I have not been able to find a, like matching lower bounds. Um, I mean, I, like certainly you can get on the right order of magnitude. Like once alpha is bigger than one over R to the one fifth, then we can always get at least R. So the answer certainly lies between two R and R. Um, but the question of whether we can have exact uh, equality here, I'm not sure. So, so first of all, of course these bounds aren't because of the way they look, I guess you can tell they're not exactly optimal. Um, and they can be optimized further, but uh, I don't know that there's a simple closed form expression because at the end of the day, um, it's, it comes down to finding the, to, to bounding the size of a root of a degree three polynomial. And there's not a closed form way to do this as far as I understand, even though people think that there kind of is, but actually the best thing you can do is kind of, what I wrote here is like uh, not the best thing you can do, but if you look at my arguments, you will see that there are almost no places where I'm actually really losing something. It's just a matter of like how carefully you want to do the analysis, I believe. Um, I mean, this isn't, there is, there might be one place where, where I'm losing something, 
We'd have to really actually look at the details to see. Um, okay, so, so that's the same picture again. And uh, I lied about that being all the, res the, the new results. There's more new results. This isn't even the full picture. Um, so here's one last result I have on, on real equiangular lines. And I promise I will not talk about them after uh, anymore. So uh, let S be at least two. So let's say S is exactly two, if you guys want. And suppose alpha is much, much bigger than one over R to the one over two S plus one. So if S is two, then this is five. So if alpha is much, much bigger than one over R to the one fifth, so if we're a little bit further away from here, then we can actually improve the bound. So to, to this, and, and like, let's just see what happens for S equals two again. So when S is two, this is pi over four. Cosine of pi over four is, is uh, one over root two. Square that, you get one half. Four times one half is two. So at the end of the day, we get one plus a half or three halves R. So better than two R. Uh, and if we go even further, we get even, we do even better. And if we go sufficiently far enough, if alpha is, you know, if alpha is bigger than this for, for S that's going to infinity, then cosine squared starts approaching one. And so we get five quarters R as a bound. And, and that's the best I can say. Um, and probably the reason why uh, doing like going from this to, to, to actually determining the answer was, is in some sense a breakthrough is because getting, doing better than five fourths is really somehow the thing that's difficult um, because it's not based on the Olam Bapana theorem. Uh, so so uh, the proof of this is based on a stronger Olam Bapana theorem. So, on Bapana just says that for like say a regular graph, um, the second eigenvalue is at least, uh, uh, so the weak version would say that the second eigenvalue is at least the square root of the degree. The strong version would say that it's at least two times the square root of the degree. And uh, then they're in between versions. And how strong of a version you have depends on how sparse your graph is. And this is crucial. Uh, the Alain Bapana theorem is only known to hold for sufficiently sparse graphs, namely having diameter at least four. And the higher the diameter, the, the better of a bound, the better of a bound you can get. But this, the best thing you can do with it is effectively giving you this. Okay, that's enough about uh, real equiangular lines. If anyone has any questions, uh, I would like to move on. Um, so here I'm, I'm just going to mention uh, a couple of results about com the, uh, in the complex setting. Um, so just to just for you guys who are not as familiar, if you consider a pair of complex lines in complex R-dimensional space, and you take a unit vector from one and another unit vector from another, then the magnitude of their inner product is uh, invariant. And so we can define the R cosine of this magnitude to be the Hermitian angle between U and V. Now, uh, I'm not the only person who's calling it this, but I don't know how well known this is, uh, but I like the word, so uh, let's go with it. And so uh, like before, we can define N superscript C sub alpha of R to be the maximum number of complex equangular lines in R dimensions with common Hermitian angle arc cosine alpha or common inner product magnitude alpha. Um, so we can again uh, ask, you know, is there an absolute bound? And indeed uh, in 75, Del Sarte, Gotos and Seidel proved that you can have at most R squared. Um, and, but unlike in the real case, uh, it's conjectured that actually for every R, the answer is R squared. There is actually, and attain a way to attain the absolute bound. Uh, this was a conjecture of Zauner from 99. Uh, and uh, moreover, he even, he even con uh, conjectured that the construction could be obtained by starting with a vector and applying uh, a whale Heisenberg group action to it, like the orbit uh, under this, this group, which is uh, not complicated group actually uh, 
to study. But uh, um, right, so so that's so that's kind of a big difference. And moreover, cases of equality, namely collections of R squared complex equilateral lines in in, in R dimensional complex space, are known as seeks or seek PLVMs. Uh, project symmetric informationally complete posi uh, positive operator valued measures, I believe. <laughs> uh, anyway, these things are, turn out to be quite important in quantum information theory. Um, I think since Zauner made his conjecture, uh, people in quantum information theory have been more excited um, because they've, they've found more applications of these things. Um, and, you know, I, I guess uh, I'll just mention that uh, these are these. These objects are important both in a theoretical sense because uh, one of the foundations of quantum mechanics known as cubism, not the art form, uh, is holds these objects as kind of a central object um, as maybe representing a standard quantum measurement. Um, and then also on a practical side, uh, I, I read somewhere in a paper that if you could create a seek if you could construct one in dim, in dimension 2048 that this should be patented um okay so so also the what is known and what was proven by del sarte gotos and seidel in 75 is that the relative bound it's the exact same bound holds for the complex version um and as far as I'm aware, there aren't really anything, there isn't really anything else about as far as upper bounds um, in general. Um, I might be wrong, like there's a lot of literature that I, that I haven't looked at. Um, but as far as like kind of bounds that work in some range, uh, I didn't really see anything like that. Um, so this is as far as I'm aware. And so here you go, guys, here's, here's an example of something which holds Right, so again, the relative bound only held when alpha is small. So here's an example of something that holds in general. And this is like looking very similar to what I showed you before, except there's a, there's a two missing from here. So it's the same kind of argument. It extends very naturally because that argument was based on eigenvalues. And so it's easy to, to generalize it. Um, unfortunately, the other argument that I had, which is based on studying the graph uh, a bit, it's not so easy to generalize. Um, and there are reasons for that. But uh, we, you know, if anyone is interested to talk to me about it, um, I think there are many interesting questions here. And anyway, so, so uh, in the abstract, okay. So I don't wanna spend too much time on this cause then I'll never, okay. But, but uh, in, the, in the abstract of this talk, I said that I'm kind of gonna discuss several results. And one of them was, um, uh, the improvement of Welch's bound. So uh, I'm not actually going to describe this too much, but I'll give a proof at the end of a of of a weaker, like a special case of this, and then you can figure out for yourself how to do it in general. It's not complicated, but it's actually potentially interesting. I cannot judge for myself how interesting, but I will just share it for you. So given some vectors. Let H be the matrix, which is the magnitude squared of the inner product between VI and VJ. So this is an, some kind of uh, entry-wise square of the gram matrix. And this H uh, dagger is its more Penrose generalized inverse. So for simplicity, you can assume H has an inverse if you could make things easier for you. So then uh, here, is, here is what I can say. First statement is that the sum over all entries of this inverse matrix is at most the R. This is, this is the first bound. And, and this bound, I will prove a special case of this. Um, in fact, when, when the vectors that you take correspond to equiangular lines, this bound is equivalent to the uh, relative bound. Like th th these are equivalent statements in, in that case, um, surprisingly, because this statement is not like a already known proof of the relative bound. So I like to think of this as a new proof of the relative bound. I believe that's somewhat justified. 
okay, so you have this, but I told you I improved the Welch bound. This is not the Welch bound. The Welch bound says is this. It says that the sum over all i and j of the magnitude squared of the inner product is at least n squared over r times one. Okay, but I have here something else. And as you can see, what I have here is always at least one because of the previous inequality. So in particular, this is an improvement of, Welch, of the Welch bound. Obviously, sometimes the Welch bound is tight. And in those cases, this must also be tight. Um, so to see why this, this, this statement is true, um, I'm actually going to give a proof of it at the end, uh, but, but maybe just a simple version. Because I want to show you that doing this computation, it's actually not hard at all. And so uh, therefore, you know, it's, it's worth, worth seeing. Mm, OK, so that's enough about complex stuff. I have one more slide to give you about uh, my results for regular graphs, just one, one kind of theorem. Um, and then I will, I will hopefully go over one proof quickly. OK. So last page of results. And I'm going to start with the corollary instead of the theorem because it's easier to look at. If I have a K regular graph with second last eigenvalue of its adjacency matrix being lambda 2 and lambda n, then provided that the spectral gap K minus lambda 2 is smaller than n, like of a lower order, uh, then we have the following. First, Lambda two is at least k to the one third. The allen bapana theorem would say that if the graph is sparse enough, you can replace this with one half. But when the graph is dense, nothing was known before this. So it's interesting. For when I say dense, I mean having diameter two or diameter three even. Uh, nothing was known. Like all of the arguments that are known simply don't work in that set, in that regime. Uh, as far as I'm aware. Um, and the other thing we can show is that this lambda two is also at least square root of negative lambda n. Uh, so in particular, if, you're, if you had a bipartite graph so that you know, negative lambda n would be equal to k, then you would really recover the Ilan Bapana theorem, even for dense uh, bipartite graphs. Um, so this is cool, um, in my opinion. And it's even more cool because I actually proved something that's tight. And, and so, and, and the proof of it is based on a reduction to equiangular lines. So it's, it's quite nice in my opinion. So here's the, the full statement, right? So uh, this is a simplified version of this um, here. And, and this is a simplified version of that. But the main point here is that actually both of these bounds are tight whenever G corresponds to a strongly regular graph whose whenever G is a strongly regular graph whose corresponding equiangular lines meet give a, meet the absolute bound in dimension R where R is n minus the multiplicity of, of lambda two. So so exactly when um, n plus one, which is the number of vectors I would have in that case, is equal to R plus one choose two. So there are four examples we know where this happens. It was the, the four examples I gave you guys in the beginning. Um, the Schleifli graph, the McLaughlin graph, and uh, uh, some uh, two, two more graphs which are quite trivial for the dimension two and three case. Uh, like the Pentagon, I think. Uh, yeah. Anyways, uh, so, so that's it. That's, that's uh, all I have for, for new results. Um, I think what's important to, for me to say, though, is that I, there are many other things you could probably prove along these lines. Um, you can, tr I, I can, I'll mention at the end maybe a bit uh, about further directions. Um, but I just think it's really beautiful. I mean, this is a purely geometric statement, and I don't know, I don't know why it holds for any other reason than, than this geometric reason, which is not hard. Okay. So, so as I promised, uh, in the last you know, 10 minutes, let me just try to give you a proof of the relative bound, uh, but a new proof, right? That will motivate uh, the, the technique, and then you will know 
how to, to solve everything that I've done for you today, you know, with enough effort. Uh, if a talented enough undergraduate could do it. Uh, okay, so here's the proof idea. Proof idea is using the Frobenius inner product, we're going to orthogonally project the R by R identity matrix onto the span of these VI, VI transpose matrices, which we had in the very beginning of the talk. When we do this, we can actually compute that its length, its Frobenius length, uh, for squared Frobenius length, I should say, decreases from R to this number. So that means R is at least this number because it's a projection. That's it, that's the whole idea. If you, if you think about it, R being at least this, it, with, with this assumption, you, you, can, you can rewrite it in this way. You could write it, rewrite it as N is at most this, this quantity. So, so indeed it's, uh, it proves the relative bound. You, you can kind of convince yourself. But this is the whole idea. It's not more complicated than this. Um, I just need to convince you that you can really compute these things, right? So obviously it's not hard to compute the length. Okay, let, let, let's just do it, right? So here's the actual proof. So first consider W to be uh, the following linear map uh, from Rn to, it maps from vectors to matrices and it maps the ith standard basis vector to the ith matrix. Um, and I just wanna say that you can totally think of W as an R squared by N matrix whose ith column is like a vectorized version of VI VI transpose. So, so you don't even have to worry about anything more complicated than that. And uh, now define the adjoint map. For a linear map between Hilbert spaces, there's always an adjoint map. Uh, I guess you guys know. Um, it's defined like this. It just satisfies the thing you would want it to satisfy. When you, go for, when you move W from here to here, it becomes W sharp and the Frobenius inner product changes. It's important though that I'm using the Frobenius inner product in, in this space. Um, okay, and, and if you think of W as a matrix, then W adjoint is just the, the transpose. Uh, right, that's all I want to say. Very good. So now, uh, now my observation is that this expression is exactly the orthogonal projection onto the span of the VI VI transpose. Well, this is just like, you know, a fact that you can look up on Wikipedia. Uh, but it's not hard to show. I mean, the, uh, to it's easy to verify that P satisfies, you know, P squared equals P and PW equals W. Th these are the, the conditions you need for, to be a uh, orthogonal projection. Uh, so this is just linear algebra, right? So now let's compute stuff. Uh, so first, the easy thing, the inner product of I with itself is just by definition, the trace of the identity, which is just the rank R. Good. And now we'll, we'll do some, now we have to compute the, the length of the projection of I. That's the more difficult thing. So um, this inner product is, is this, and, and because of the properties of a projection, you can write it like that. P sharp P is just P. And we expand it out based on the definition and we get the following thing. So now, um, the, if you look at W sharp I, this term, we, we can understand it. It's actually not hard, right? What is W sharp I? It's a vector and its ith coordinate is actually, well, you can think about it as by definition, just the Frobenius inner product of VI VI transpose with the identity, which is just one for any, for any I. So, so this whole vector is just the all ones vector. And hey, this is its transpose. So we already figured out most of the picture. Um, the only thing left is to figure out this middle part, right? This W sharp W. Um, but what is that? We actually already calculated it before. W sharp W of IJ is just the Frobenius inner product between the ith and the j uh, projection matrix. And we already calculated this thing. It was, it was VI VJ inner product squared, right? And moreover, we, we have equiangular lines. So this is just alpha squared, we know. So therefore this whole matrix is just a matrix which has ones in the diagonal and alpha squared off the diagonal. 
and you can always write it like this. Um, and therefore, it's actually invertible. And we can actually compute its inverse. Here it is explicitly. So now that we have its inverse, we, we have all the terms we need. And we can finish up. So therefore, we, we plug in you know, the definition. So, so you get the all ones vector here. Um, I pulled out the one minus one over one myself is squared here. And what I'm left with is just this. You can just work it out. You do get what you want, right? I mean, you have to do a little basic maths, but you can convince yourself that this is, that this is true. So as I mentioned before, uh, if, if uh, you didn't start with equiangular lines, then uh, this would yield the first, this would give you the first step in the, in the improved Welch bound, the first bound I, I, I told you guys in the previous page. Um, so this, this matrix W sharp W is, is, the, is the matrix H from before. And its inverse shows up exactly here. And when it doesn't have an inverse, you can put a, a, a generalized inverse here and it would still be true. I hope. Okay, so so that's enough. I, I'm I'm basically done now. Uh, if anyone has any questions, oh wait, I should just mention. Okay, never mind. This is, so so now that I've said all this, uh, the important thing is that hey, we can actually project other matrices besides the identity. This this is kind of the main the main idea. So in particular, if we let V be the the matrix whose ith column is VI, so that VX is like a linear combination of the VIs, then the types of matrices I project are of the form this, VX, VY transpose. Um, the question of why I project symmetric matrices is because, well, I'm projecting onto the span of these guys, and this is a space of symmetric matrices. And linear combinations of symmetric matrices are symmetric. So if I'm to hope for my projection not losing anything, not losing any information, if I, if I have any hope of getting tight bounds, then I, I had better restrict to symmetric matrices. Um, and so you can plug in plenty of things into this, but by taking X and Y to be either a standard basis vector or an eigenvector uh, of the corresponding gram matrix, uh, we obtain, you know, and doing the same thing of projecting and seeing that the length must decrease, we obtain all of the new bounds that, that I talked to you guys about today. Um, and from that, we can derive all our results. Um, and the bonus benefit of it is that the, whenever, uh, is that all the bounds we prove are actually gonna be tight whenever these guys span the space of all symmetric matrices, which is exactly the case where you have the absolute bound being met. So this explains why uh, the, sh the regular graphs inequality I showed you is tight, which is because it has to be for those examples. Um, so great. So, so that's, that's it. Um, I have some future directions for research here, but um, perhaps if you want to ask questions first, I will give, I will, I will, uh, before discussing this, I will wait if you have any questions. Um, if it's okay, Igor, maybe we'd like to hear this so that we can include this on the recorded part of, of the oh, okay. talk. Okay, sorry, fine, no problems. So, all right, so then future directions for research. So uh, I'm not gonna, I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say there's a ton of things you could do from this. Um, I feel like there's many different directions which are very promising. Um, so, Obviously, uh, alpha minus alpha codes are an example of spherical L codes. Um, and, and definitely, I mean, I, I'm 100% certain that the, the methods I have extend to, to L codes more generally. Um, this is stuff that I, you know, have somewhat worked out, but it's, it's still, you know, uh, not so precise because I, I, I decided that I want to work with more collaborators tired of working on my own, 
you know, I've been working on this stuff for a long time and uh, it's better to work with people. Um, so hopefully someone else can help me with this stuff because then I won't be as lonely. Uh, the other possibility is uh, to extend it to the case where alpha is the closed interval for minus one to this, th this corresponds to the classical question of packing spherical caps on a sphere and also therefore quite related to packing sphere packing in general. Um, so I don't know if my methods would extend to this regime. This is the only thing I'm where, where I, I'm not so certain that it would, uh, but it would certainly be very exciting if, if they did. Um, we can definitely generalize to equiangular subspaces. Uh, it's certainly, uh, at least for certain kinds of equiangular subspaces, which is a problem that I've studied, um, the, the methods should extend. Um, you can also generalize this to sign graphs and, and more generally unitarily sign graphs uh, because, well, equiangular lines are just complete sign graphs or, or complex equiangular lines are complete unitarily sign graphs. So um, definitely uh, there's at least one paper where they, they use this kind of um, this, this approach of, that I had in my PhD thesis uh, with Benny, this, this previous stuff. Um, so because this work generalizes that, it probably would also generalize whatever else uh, was, what other, what, whatever else was based on it. Um, another thing is that you can apply this, uh, the, the methods to other graph matrices like the Laplacian matrix. Um, so I, I, I restricted myself to regular graphs because they, they generalize, they correspond nicely to equiangular lines. Um, but, you know, you could do this process more generally. You don't need to arrive at equiangular lines at the end. So you, you can start with other matrices and uh, I'm working on what I can get for, for unweighted Laplacian. It should just somehow be a generalization of what I presented to you earlier, but uh, things get a bit more complicated. And the last thing, which uh, I never get to talk about, is a very exciting thing that I found, which uh, I, as far as I know, no one, no one has, has seen this um, connection so much. So there's a conjecture on the multiplicity of the second eigenvalue of a Laplacian on a, on a Riemann surface, you know, a two-dimensional two Riemann surface with some genus. And moreover, you can formulate a version of this same statement for, for graphs or for their adjacency matrix or for a Laplacian matrix. And, and if you could prove a version of this for regular graphs, that would actually uh, be very important because it would, it would allow you to extend the, um, uh, the results of Tidor and uh, Yao's, uh, Zhang, Tidor, Yao, Zhang, and Zhao, uh, their exactness result, we, we could probably extend it further if you had better understanding of the multiplicity of the second eigenvalue of a regular graph, uh, or of, of a graph, not regular, just of a graph. Um, and it turns out that somehow this is what you might expect, at least maybe for sparse graphs, you could expect this. Anyway, nothing like this is known. And, and uh, the best bound we have here is like n over log log n. So certainly room for improvement. Okay, uh, with this, I, I will stop. All right, thanks a lot, Igor. And let's all, gently press the reactions button and and click on the clap icon. That's, that's my dumb joke because they always say smash it, but it doesn't matter how hard you do it as long as you actually click. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, let's open the floor for questions, please.